And so this talk is going to look at trying to employ, try to use some of the NetFlow that we have at Kentic to try to make some observations about where we are with RPI RV adoption. So just to uh, step back uh, to look, set the scene here, where are we with uh, adoption? You know, RPKI presently still stands as the internet's best defense against BGB hijacks due to typos or other mishaps, less so the determined adversary. Uh, it's not foolproof, but it does, we have enough routing leaks that this is uh, still a worthwhile uh, endeavor. But with any distributed security mechanism, it requires, broad adoption requires many individual actions and every individual to trying to decide, are they gonna uh, participate in RPKI has to ask a couple questions. And at the outset, you're asking, well, why would I reject invalids uh, if there's if, if no one or very few people are signing uh, or creating ROAs? Or why would I bother creating a ROA if no one's uh, rejecting invalids? And those days are in the past, I think we can agree on, that there's been enormous progress in recent years in, on both fronts. So we are, there has been, a last, just in the last couple of years, enormous project, product, progress with uh, the tier one NSPs agreeing to drop uh, or reject RPI invalid routes. Nowadays, if you have a, uh, an invalid route, it's gonna be propagated a lot less than a, a route that is either valid or unknown. So this is a short list of some of the uh, largest telecoms in the world that are now drop, or rejecting RPI invalid uh, uh, routes. Also, uh, NIST, which is a, a U.S. Um, uh, government, U.S. government agency that uh, has a, a department that studies RPI, has a website. I listed the link in the bottom here, where they post uh, a lot of uh, statistics around you know the um, where we're at with RPI and also. Hand, it's very handy. It has a, a temporal aspect to it too, so you can see what's the trend line, or where where are things, uh, how are things changing. And I would say that a couple of years ago, in the graph that we're looking at, there's a there's a bit of an inflection point where the number of routes that are valid, uh, meaning that there's a, a signed ROA and the route EMPGP agrees with the ROA, uh, that is on the on the upswing. And the number of routes that are unknown uh, or have no um, uh, ROA, that's going down. So these are moving in the right uh, direction. And really, these are the main categories. It's either unknown or valid. Uh, there are persistent routes that are invalid. And that's actually depicted on this graph as well. You'd be uh, forgiven if you thought it was just a red line along the x-axis, because that's essentially what it is. It's a very, very small amount that are persistently invalid due to generally a, a misconfiguration. Someone has messed something up. Right, so in this space, it's an active area of research of just measuring uh, RPI uh, deployment. And there's two steps that have to take place to reject an invalid route, which is the ultimate objective of this whole endeavor. So step one, the owners of the resources have to create ROAs that assert the valid origin and prefix length of, of the route. That's step one. And then step two, on the other end, on the receiving end of the routes, someone has to use that information to then reject the invalids. Um, so on the left-hand side, you've got that NIST site I mentioned. There's a uh, RIPE. RIPE has a RIPE stat, which uh, we'll look at a little later in this presentation. There's some useful widgets and uh, tools for uh, measuring uh, RPI in a country. Uh, that's on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, it's a, it's a much trickier problem trying to measure uh, you know, passively where uh, uh, AS, ASs around the world are, are dropping invalids. Um, so this talk is mostly on the left-hand side, on the area that I think we were considering, uh, we would have considered that we probably knew the answer, or we understood where we're at. And I guess I'm here with this data to say that we didn't know uh, and actually, it's a little different than what we what we thought if it if we were just doing a purely BGP analysis. And so, if we revisit uh, what the NIST monitor has got, this is a recent um, well, it's about a month old, but it's it doesn't look that much different if you were to check it today. Uh, about thirty four percent of V four BGP routes are presently signed. That means there's two to one unknowns for an, uh, to a valid an unknown route gets no protection from the RPI system. Uh, it could be hijacked due to a leak, 
uh, whatever, it's only the valid uh, ones that are going to be uh, protected by the system. Uh, if we looked at the V6 uh, stats, it's similar. It's 32% versus 34%. But I guess the question that uh, crossed my mind when I looked at this and looked at the data that we at Kentic have got, of what proportion of the overall traffic is safeguarded by that 31.1% of V4 uh, BGP routes that are signed? Because we think that it's different. And so at this point in this talk, I want to just uh, make a quick detour uh, to way back in 2019, long before the pandemic, a million years ago, uh, Job, my co-author, and Paolo Lucente at, uh, at NTT had um, been wrestling with, uh, in the course of trying to promote RPI, one uh, excuse that uh, people would encounter was that uh, Networks didn't want to drop uh, customer traffic, and they were worried that if they started rejecting uh, RPI invalids, that it would affect user uh, communications. And so to address this, uh, Job and Lucente uh, went into the PMA CCT uh, uh, network, uh, open source network tool, and extended it to uh, do this NetFlow plus RPI analysis. So you could just run this on your own, on your own network, you still can, and get a sense for if I were to start stop dropping ballads, how much traffic, what exactly would I lose? So you could answer that question. It's not a theoretical thing. You could actually uh, know it. So they, they added this functionality to this tool. Uh, and at the end of this uh, email to the Nanog list, uh, throughout the gauntlet, to the major NetFlow analytics companies, one of those was Kentic, and said that uh, uh, these companies ought to copy this feature because it's really important for uh, RPI adoption to be able to answer questions about RPI. Uh, at Kentic, we thought that was a good idea, and so we did it. Within the next year, we had this as a as a as a uh, criteria that you can you can uh, do analysis on, uh, and that's what that's going to be the basis of. Yeah, okay. All right, so uh, we'll take a quick detour to understand uh, some of the origin of this feature functionality within Kentic. So back in 2019, uh, long before the pandemic, years and years and years ago, uh, uh, Paul, uh, my co-author, co Job Snyder, as well as uh, Paolo Lucente, they were at NTT, and they took the PMA CCT tool, it's an open source network anal analysis tool, uh, and extended it to offer a, um, be able to do a, a integrate RPI analysis into NetFlow analysis. And the objective was to try to address the question of, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, networks that were hesitant about uh, uh, deploying RPI were concerned about, would this affect customer traffic? And if so, they wouldn't want to upset their customers. And so uh, instead of debating this in, in theory or in the th theoretic, theoretical, uh, they added this functionality into this tool so that you could you could run it on your own network, import your uh, NetFlow, and know exactly what would be the impact had you uh, had you started dropping RPKI invalid routes. Um, after creating this uh, functionality, uh, Joe wrote a uh, email out to the Nanog list, and at the end of it. <coughs> um, Put out a challenge to the major NetFlow and analytics companies, um, uh, asking them to adopt this, this feature uh, for the good of the internet. And within a year, uh, Kentic uh, accepted this challenge and uh, and deployed this functionality, so that RPI is a uh, a uh, another dimension that you can do uh, analysis of your NetFlow data. And that's what uh, the rest of this talk is is based on. So that email from the previous slide was February 2019. Uh, the following month, uh, Job uh, gave a talk at DK Nog in Denmark in March 2019, so three years ago, uh, where he looked at some of the results uh, of the of running PMA CCT on NTT's network, where they handle a very large amount of internet traffic. And this graphic was a slide from that presentation where he was presenting how much uh, of the different types of traffic in bits per second they were seeing at NTT. 
And as you can see, uh, the vast majority is this blue, which is RPK unknown. So traffic going to uh, route destinations that lack an R ROA, a ROA. Um, and in orange, these are two routes that are valid. And then there's a very fine red line of persistent uh, invalid uh, routes. But uh, that's where they were three years ago. And we'll see in a minute, we've come a long way since then. So another slide from that presentation that's important to point out is uh, a one that Job entitled, not everyone needs to do RPKI. So this was maybe a provocative statement, uh, but the thinking is that due to the consolidation of the internet industry, if you were to only get a handful of content providers and a, maybe the, some DNS service providers and eyeball networks uh, to deploy RPKI with their the, the large amount of resources that they have, that you would be protecting a vast majority of uh, the internet's traffic or a large, yeah, a large, a large majority. You'd have a lot of benefit if only just uh, maybe 20 or so companies did this. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep that in mind when we look at some of the results uh, later. So why does Kentic have anything to say about this? So uh, Kentic um, does a lot of things. Uh, it's it's main uh, product has been around NetFlow analysis uh, for network opt optimization, DDoS detection, those kind of things. Uh, we have over 300 customers and about half of them have opted in to uh, using their NetFlow that they send to us uh, to be used for aggregate analysis. So analysis that does not identify any individual uh, customer. And that's what I'll use in this presentation. And that's the kind of data that I use when I'm uh, speaking to the media about some sort of an internet shutdown somewhere in the world or some other uh, global event. Uh, that's the data I'm using. Um, it's worth noting that this analysis uh, is subject to the biases of the customer set of our customer set. Uh, and so we are heavily skewed towards the US and uh, companies that are in the uh, internet industry. So um, having said that, it's it's a very large uh, amount of data and I think it's still very informative, but it's worth keeping in mind that that, uh, that bias does exist. So back to the NetFlow analytics platform. Uh, so what we had adopted from Job's, Job's suggestion was to, uh, as we, ingest uh, NetFlow records, we add uh, BGP, the BGP route of that router uh, for both the source and destination, but then for the destination, we'll do a RPKI evaluation at the time. Uh, and that allows us to then in aggregate do uh, uh, analysis of you know, how much traffic uh, is going to, it's just another dimension that we can use. Uh, uh, any, any, any insights you can get out of NetFlow, you can get those plus uh, uh, RPKI evaluations. Um, yeah, so originally it was built to, uh, like I said, on the, um, uh, with the Job's email to Nanog, uh, so just to identify how much traffic will be lost by dropping invalids, but there's a lot more you can do with it. So what are the four state cases that we uh, classify? So there's a uh, valid, so a route's uh, got a, a valid, has a, has a ROA and, the, and is routed in BGP uh, in compliance with that ROA. Uh, there's also unknown, invalid and then invalid, but covered by a valid or unknown. So had you dropped that invalid route, there was an existing route, a covering route that would have allowed uh, your routers to send the traffic anyway. So that's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an important case to, to um, call out. Joe wanted me to mention that that is, that case number four is not part of the BGP or IETF specs on uh, RPI. Uh, that is just an analysis uh, uh, state. And in this little screenshot from bgp.ag.net, this is an example of a slash 24, has a little red key that uh, suggests that it's, um, that denotes that it's RPI invalid, but there's a covering prefix. And so you would send, use the covering prefix to send this traffic. All right, so we established that only about one third of BGP routes have ROAs. And the question is how much traffic, because routes do not equal traffic. Uh, how much traffic are we talking about? So we looked at a period of analysis of a week, uh, seven days, uh, the beginning of February, and here are the main observations. The f there's less than a percent of traffic that is invalid, but covering, meaning that had you dropped the routes, you would have delivered it anyway, based on a covering prefix. We saw 42.6% uh, of 
the traffic as measured in bits per second uh, is going to unknown um, and 56.4 going to valid. So that means that the majority of the, of the bits that are getting sent and the net flow that we have is going to routes that are RPI valid and then a very small amount are invalid. Um, and it's worth just stating again that this uh, traffic to invalid routes is infinitesimal. This is not a reason to not drop invalids. At least that's our opinion. Uh, you can run the PMA CCT tool or use our stuff uh, to answer that question for yourself. But it's um, anyway. So then, if we look at, I mentioned the ripe stat tool. Uh, we're going to look at that a little bit now. Uh, if we were to go, you know, country by country, and look at row creation. Uh, we'll use this uh, this tool. So here's here's Poland. We'll visit that again. Uh, you can pull it up. And and what's neat about this is that it looks back in the uh, for the past year, and so you can see some uh, what kind of trends we're looking at. But in the case uh, of take like the U.S. for example, uh, for V4 uh, we saw in RipeStat it measures uh, twenty four point two percent of V4 IP address space is covered by ROAs. 20%, 20.1% for V6. When we look at bits per second, uh, it's completely different. It's 58.5% uh, of bits per second. So why is that? Oops. Why is that? So it has to do with uh, Job's prediction of uh, trying to use uh, the, uh, the consolidation of the internet industry to our advantage. Uh, for the United States, uh, the major eyeball networks um, are Comcast and Spectrum, and they have recently had RPI uh, deployments where they you know, we're seeing uh, nearly all traffic going to these networks, which is a lot, as uh, RPI valid. And then on the other side, the content providers, we have Amazon, Google are at 100%. Uh, Cloudflare is uh, very high, uh, uh, near, uh, near total uh, of RPI valid. And so uh, these, got, these entities and a few more like them uh, may not represent the majority of B2B routes or the majority of, B2, of IP address space, but they do uh, account for a lot of traffic within the United States. So uh, we won't go look at this chart. We'll, we'll break this chart into um, uh, a couple different regions. We started to go around and look at the top 20 or so uh, countries that we're seeing traffic to and see how they break down uh, in um, RPI valid versus unknown uh, traffic. All right, so we mentioned the uh, the US here a couple of slides ago at 58% 50, 50, of traffic. Uh, we, we're kind of calling it, um, yeah, this is, this is valid. Uh, what, what part is valid? So in bits per second, we're seeing 58%. Uh, in just address space, it's you know, 24, 20. If it's V4, V6. Uh, Canada, Brazil are lower numbers. Mexico is one of those few that the, uh, the bits per second is lower than the uh, percent of IP addresses. Uh, if we look at Europe, here's Poland in the center, doing very well. Uh, Europe does very well here with Turkey. At near universal um, uh, traffic is uh, going to Turkey is going to uh, RPI valid routes. Um, yeah, Poland's doing very well. Uh, it's very similar to the V4, so maybe that in this case it's not um, that much different. Um, and uh, if we look at Asia plus Australia, uh, it's it's all over the place. So you have uh, Taiwan and the Philippines, a very very uh, big. RPI deployments, um, uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum, if China and South Korea have almost no RPI, and uh, the stats essentially agree with each other, there's no V4 space, there's no IP space, and there's no flow uh, that uh, that's uh, going to valid routes. You know, some other observations. You know, because this is NetFlow, any any uh, features that we can um, uh, any that we can see in NetFlow, we can also use for this RPI analysis. So if we break it down by protocol, so V6 versus V4, we can see that um, there's a lot more, there's a higher percentage of valid traffic, traffic going to valid routes in V4 than in V6. And then uh, you're going by ports. Um, I think, you know, the port 80 uh, is very, is very, very high. And I think that has to do with those, you know, content providers that we had uh, a moment ago. 
uh, that uh, they have near universal uh, RPI deployments. And um, yeah, so here's something interesting. So we, uh, when I look back at the RipeStat tool for various countries, you could see some movements. So I went to go back and look and see how that looked in our data. And, uh, and sure enough, we can see it, that the numbers aren't one-to-one -one because we're looking at different types of data, but uh, we can the movements are correlated. So in this case, in Poland, late September, there was a big, uh, evidently a big RPI uh, deployment and uh, going from 39% to 64% of V4 IP address space. And then when we looked at it in, uh, in NetFlow, we saw the traffic uh, stats go from 46 to 60%. Um, it's also uh, handy to look at uh, outages when they occur. So the RPI system, uh, when it suffers a failure, it fails open. Uh, so nobody, there should be no disruptions as a result of an outage. And we saw that in Taiwan. So in September, there was a, the Taiwan NIC had an outage. And so for uh, about a day, uh, no one could uh, evaluate whether um, uh, any Taiwanese routes, whether they're valid or invalid. And so we saw this uh, uh, in our NetFlow. That's what the picture we're looking at here. Uh, the, you can see the, the shape of the traffic stayed the same as uh, because um, there were no disruptions that we could find. Uh, but the, the traffic all ended up getting classified to unknown. And then when the system came back on, it went back to valid. Uh, but the, yeah, but the, the put stopper there is that there was um, uh, no disruptions. And then we also see phenomenon uh, like this, where you know, this, these statistics don't stay uh, static over time. In fact, uh, there's a, a, a fluctuation that occurs during the course of the day. Uh, so uh, we're seeing uh, a little undulation uh, throughout the day uh, going between uh, as high as 57% of uh, traffic uh, being going to valid routes down to 54%. And we theorize this has to do with, uh, at least uh, in the U.S., a lot of the fixed lines have done RPI deployments, but the mobile carriers have uh, uh, are still um, uh, behind. And uh, as people... Uh, move from one uh, place to another wh where they're working at their desk on a fixed line and now they're later they're in the evening maybe on their phone uh, as the behaviors of the user shift then this percentage shifts that's our theory for that but um, to wrap up uh, so the the best practice is to reject RPI invalid routes um, so we would argue that uh, this is not a risk to legitimate traffic, but if you don't, you don't need to take my word for it. You can run this uh, analysis yourself with either the PMACC tool, or you could do a trial with Kentic. Uh, that's another way you could uh, test this out to see exactly what would be dropped if you were to, uh, what traffic would be potentially disrupted if you dropped uh, invalids. Um, and I think uh, the takeaway from this is that you know, we would argue that the majority, likely the majority of the your outbound traffic is uh, um, going to uh, RPI valid routes. So dropping in valids would protect your outbound traffic from, again, the typos, various BGP mishaps. Some other things that people have started doing that uh, are not recommended is modifying either local pref or BGP communities based on validation states. Um, so that that may be okay to do internally, but there are a couple of providers that are doing this globally. And the concern is that, you know, this past year there was a vulnerability found in uh, uh, that validators did not check uh, the type of data was sent to them. You could, you could crash a validator. And in that case that you crash someone's validator, they would, if you were uh, issuing communities or local pref based on validation states, you would suddenly have to change all the routes that you saw and it would create a, a huge um, simultaneous announcement of many, many uh, announcements of BGP announcements as you're changing the states of potentially thousands of routes. Uh, and this would create, you know, there's a risk there of a massive BGP turn. But uh, so those are the uh, recommended actions. Um, Poland's doing pretty well uh, in this. And um, yeah, thanks for your attention. If you have any questions on RPI, uh, reach out to what Job likes to call the BGB A team. That's me, Job, and Job's cat. I have a cat too, and he did not make the team. So let me know if you have any questions, please. <laughs>